The Van Etten Creek Chronicles by Dennis Michael Morrison. Prologue. Van Etten Creek has changed over the centuries. At times in the prehistoric past, its waters have been so risen that it was not just a creek, but a mighty river. And sometimes the waves subsided so that the creek was but a shallow trickle. It has always been there watching the pageant of human history and often taking an active role in it. Its course is winding. Ancient banks at one point form a bluff some 30 feet high. A more beautiful spot cannot be found anywhere in the Great Lakes region. This lofty place overlooks not only the bend in the creek, but beyond that a large flat plain now green with second growth pine. A millennium and a half ago, this vista was a large area of sluggish waters where Indians fished, trapped turtles, beaver, and collected shellfish to sustain, sustain themselves with. The bluff must have been seen as being closer to God, Gichi Manitu, as they knew him. There is a burial ground there that was used some 6,000 years ago. Those spirited people of old still lie in silent slumber beneath the shifting sands. 1,400 years ago, there was a vast village of bir birch bark lodges at one point near where the town of Ascota currently stands. Under the dry pine needles and mat of decaying leaves, many things are left that the Indians created from what nature provided, things to carry out their daily lives. Early white explorers visited this village site whose history was long and proud. Then came its decline. The Europeans traded many products brought from the old world which made life easier for the Indians. It also sent them into a state of dishonor as the misuse of fire water spread. European diseases ravaged the villages, filling new grave sites to overflowing with people of all ages, but the Europeans flourished. The white newcomers um, sailed their masted schooners up Lake Huron and landed them at the mouth of the creek where a bustling fishing industry began and grew, bringing a great deal of wealth from markets out east. Lumbermen came later and cut down the massive pine forest so that not a single aged tree exists today. Everything is now third or fourth growth. What lumber barons did not take, fire claimed when the area was devastated in the early part of the century. But Ascota perseveres, and when it comes time for the earth to change, and the current people who call its banks home are gone, the creek will heal itself, and the remains of this civilization will mingle beneath the sands of time with the relics of other long-gone people. The creek will continue on waiting for new children to come and seek nurturing from its banks and waters. Manhattan Creek always has been here, and it always will be. Part 1. A Mystical Lodge on Manhattan Creek The Indians who lived along Manhattan Creek had a long and proud, proud heritage. Little Eagle sat on the high bluff looking out over the creek and marshlands beyond. He was a very spiritual youth, and though by this point in time no physical trace was left on the surface sands of the burials below him, he could feel the presence of the ancient spirits. A young boy his own age had been buried here once, but that was nearly 4,500 years ago. His story is told in, in my booklet, Fictional Scenes from a Late Archaic Burial at Old Vanetten Creek. Little Eagle was about to become a man as measured by his people. He was to go out <clears throat> along the creek, far from his people's village, and when he arrived at his place he would build a small lodge where he would fast for several days and seek a vision whose message would guide him through the rest of his life. On the bluff, separated from his people, he called upon the spirits of his grandfathers to lead him to the place where his fasting lodge should be built. Guided by silent, unseen forces, Little Eagle rose from the sand and began walking along the creek to the north. He walked a long ways, past an outcropping of clay where the women of his village were escorted to obtain clay from which they made cooking pots. He walked on for hours, listening to the birds sing, trying to become one with all that Gichi Manitu had put around him, yet the, yet the sought-after sign still eluded him. The sun edged towards the horizon, sending out brilliant hues of orange through crystal clear air. A glint caught his eye, a flickering in the woods at the creek bank just ahead. But as he watched, Little Eagle realized this was not just the sun reflecting off some silk and spider web. It was a little creature flying about erratically, 
he recognized the little entity as one of the polyganic, a guardian spirit that his grandfather had told him about often. He knew the small spirit as it glided over the water because he had seen the polyganic before. Every so often the little spirits would visit the edge of his bed late at night. He would awaken to see the small spark-like spirits dancing wildly about in a teasing manner. He was never afraid of the little ones, and he told his grandfather, who was a medicine man of renown, about them. And the elder smiled and explained to Little Eagle that not often do the Powaganic come to one so young. They are a sign, he told him, that you will be a powerful medicine man, and that you will talk to the spirits from the sacred lodge of the, for the people. The dancing, flitting little spirit was a sign that Little Eagle had asked for, and he stopped at this point on the creek bank. He took from a leather pouch on his side a small bit of kinnikinick and laid an offering on this spot. Little Eagle looked to the west, for the sun was now gone and shades of purple had replaced the brilliant orange that had only a short time ago been in the sky. There was no time this night to build a lodge. He would have to do that when the light came in the morning. The night air was chilled as he gathered some pine boughs and covered himself beneath a majestic old tree. As he looked out into the night, the creek was before him. Silver moonlight danced on the surface of the gently flowing waters. Under the cover of darkness, he saw a dugout canoe paddled by two braves sweep swiftly past. He recognized them, so was unconcerned for those at his village. Usually night travelers on the creek meant warring scouts. Little Eagle was weary from his long walk, and pangs of hunger shot through his stomach. He had to be strong and ignore the desires of the flesh. His eyes grew heavy as a mist rose from the waters of Annetton Creek. And in the distance, a hoot owl called, and the frogs sang with what sounded like a million voices praising their creator. A wolf howled, but content and unconcerned, little eagle fell asleep in the resting arms of Annetton Creek. Little eagle awoke once during the night to see a small whirlwind of Powaganic. He was far from alone, and he took comfort in the little spirits who were watching over him. And finally, as the darkness gave way to the misty morning light, Little Eagle uncovered himself and commenced to gather sapling poles to make the frame of his lodge. He set the poles firmly into the bank and with vines secured them together at the top to form a sort of dome. Then he peeled birch bark from nearby trees and covered his small fasting lodge. Upon completion, he went inside determined not to leave the lodge until his vision had come to him. His first day in the lodge passed with chanting praises to Gichi Manitu, meditating and sleeping. The second day was much the same, but in the early hours of the third day, while he laid resting on the floor of green pine boughs, he heard a call from outside. Little Eagle, you must come to the water's edge. Little Eagle wiped the sleep from his eyes and crawled from the lodge. He rose unsteadily as he was weakened from the fast. A heavy fog hung close to the creek, and Little Eagle called out, I am here. Who is it that wants me? Show yourself to me. Little Eagle, you must come to the water's edge. And the boy walked slowly <clears throat> to the edge of the creek. As he approached, a shadowy form took shape in the fog. When he got to the edge of the creek, the mist parted, and an aged brave stood there upon the flowing surface of the water. The elder's hair and the hides he wore were as white as the snow and Little Eagle fell to his knees and closed his eyes with his head bowed. Are you the great spirit, the creator of all things? No, my son, I am not. I am the spirit of these waters. Your people are my people whom I love dearly and provide for. Soon your grandfather, my people's aged medicine man, will come to join me in the world of the spirits, and you will replace him. I chose you long ago and sent my polyganic as a sign to you. The turtle, which is a sign of my father, Gichimanitu, will be your totem through your worldly life. The Creator's wisdom will be upon you, and you will be a voice between my people and my father. Thank you, sweet spirit of the waters. Thank you for looking upon me to be worthy. And the spirit raised its hands and hand and touched the young Madison man on the forehead. There was a blinding glare, and little eagle, who would henceforth be called Thundering Waters, fell backward onto the wet sands. And when he awoke, he felt refreshed and was able to walk back to his village. His father and grandfather were anxious to hear what had happened to him, but first they prepared for him a much-needed meal. After he ate the fish, clams, and crayfish, he looked to his elders and told them of his vision. 
His grandfather's, whose eyes were dimmed with age, smiled approvingly. I knew this was to be. I felt it in my soul. And then he said to Thundering Waters, You must now build a shaking lodge by the edge of the creek to show our people that you have been given my powers. The word was spread concerning Thundering Waters, and after resting for a day, Thundering Waters woke his grandfather at the break of light so that he could instruct him on how to build his first shaking lodge. They walked to the creek bank, and the old man sat down. He looked to his grandson and said, I will sit here. The work is too much for me. Let me tell you what must be done. You must bring seven long poles, sturdy poles. They must be from seven different trees. You will bring birch, ash, maple, oak, cedar, pine, and spruce. Now go and bring these things here. When the poles were collected, they were set into the sand at the creek's edge. They were bound at the top with vines forming a sort of conical structure. All the while, Thundering Waters busied himself with this sacred work, for he could feel the spirit of the water watching him. The outside of the lodge was then covered very loosely with birch bark and mats woven from cattails. The grandfather explained to Thundering Waters, You must leave the covering loose so people can look inside during the ceremony. They must see that it is you, um, not you causing the commotion, but the spirits. The bottom of the lodge was covered with spruce boughs, which had been freshly cut, and when these were laid out, the lodge was finished. It is good, grandfather. It is very good. Now remember, this lodge can be used only once. On the morning following tonight's ceremony, you must take the lodge apart, and all the pieces must be burned next to the creek so that the power that was in the lodge may flow back to the spirit of the water. And with the lodge finished, Thundering Waters walked around the lodge, sensing the eager anticipation of the spirits for him to begin. Villagers were gathering for the ceremony, and at dusk approached, <clears throat> as dusk approached, he waited a short while longer so that all who could attend would have a chance to get there. Tonight was a very important night, for he would receive his grandfather's powers, and the new medicine man would be initiated. As a silence fell over the gathering, Thundering Waters knew that it was time to enter the lodge. Thundering Waters entered the lodge and sat cross-legged on the fragrant boughs. The spirits were very eager, for no sooner had he entered the lodge than he felt the air stirring, and he tipped his head back and looked towards the top of the lodge where the Polyganic were spinning wildly about, and the people gathered without, without, um, without gave gasps of awe as they saw the luminous sparks <clears throat> dancing about their new medicine man. The tiny, brilliant shapes were ever-changing. Sometimes they looked like animals, and other times like humans, and still other times a weird combination of both animal and human. The lodge and surrounding area was filled with loud, whistling sounds. There were voices, shrill voices, that were human and yet were not, and other sounds like squealing rabbits, crows cawing, deer snorting, and thunderstorms in the four winds. In as the commotion reached a shattering pitch, as the spirit of Mikkanek, the great turtle spirit, descended and lightning upon thundering waters, and a sudden calm ensued. The luminous Pawaganek laid on the boughs like hundreds of fireflies giving an eerie glow to the scene within the lodge. And one by one, each who <clears throat> had need, people of the village came before the lodge and asked questions of thundering waters, who was now possessed by the creator spirit. And this night, he prophesied and healed and gave consolation to his people. As all this transpired by the edge of the gently flowing creek, the elderly medicine man stood back from the crows and the crowds, and he smiled and brushed back tears from one eye. He said, I will miss you all. Unnoticed by the enthralled, enthralled gathering, as he walked away through the darkness, along the bank he climbed until he reached the pinnacle of the high old bank. He knew this was a place where so many of his dead ancestors were gathered. Hands raised toward the stars, he, his proud head dropped against his chest, and in an instant he was no more. He went to live with the spirit of the water, just as thundering water would one day do also. Part 2. A Captive Heart Thundering Waters had served the Great Spirit now with a pure heart for over sixty years. He was old and gray, and his powers were waning. Yet he tried to hang on to life. He needed to help his people still, uh, for they had slipped into a bad period of war with tribes far to the south and east.
His task was one for a much younger, younger sh shaman, uh, but there was no one to whom the water spirit felt was deserving of the powers. There must be one pure heart in our clan who can take my place. For thousands of years there had been an unbroken brotherhood of shamans serving the people who lived on the banks of Annetton Creek. Oh, Gitchi Manitu, he, he implored, if there is no one here, please send someone who can take my place and lead your people down the paths of your goodness. A band of warriors from the tribe which dwells on, on Vanetton Creek had made their way down Lake, the Lake Huron shoreline to join other allied braves in what would be a single strong assault against tribes of the Iroquois nation who were encroaching upon the southern borders of the three brothers, Ottawa, Chippewa, and Potawatomi, of which the Vanetton Creek band were of Ottawa affiliation. This was a strong alliance of over 200 warriors with heavy laden dugout canoes. Their strike against the foe, their foe was sudden, unexpected, and quite decisive. It was planned to occur during the summer festival when the Iroquois were most likely to have their weapons laid aside. At a large village of longhouses on a mighty river hundreds of miles south of Annetton Creek, an important assemblage was being held. The Brotherhood of the Great Healing Society were in a holy council. It was during this mighty assembly that the three brothers struck. It was during this mighty assembly that the three brothers struck killing, struck killing mercilessly many men, women, and children. Their greatest coup was not so much the carnage and flaming destruction that was left behind, but the capture of many women and young girls who would be taken back to the lakes region to serve as slaves in their camp. Determined not to be one of these captive hearts, Morning Dew slipped into the council lodge where she was one of, of uh, the few women privileged to attend. But Morning Dew was no ordinary woman. She was a spiritual woman of great prophetic power. She had tried to warn her people weeks before of the coming attack. But despite her reputation as a great seer, she was scoffed at. The powerful Iroquois chieftains would not believe that the three brothers had the courage to mount such an attack. Many scouts had been sent out, but there was no sign to support Morning Dew's prog prognostications. The sound of the, of the women's screams, the crying of the children, and savage war hoops filled the air, piercing her tender ears. Morning Dew's world was collapsing around her, and her instinct for self-survival took hold. She took all the trimmings that associated her as a prophetess from around her neck. She knelt to her native soil and with her hands dug a hole and placed the sacred amulets in the ground, covering them quickly. But she had already been seen. An Ottawa brave who was, um, who dwelled in, on Bennett and Creek knocked Morning Dew to the ground, and as she tried to struggle to her feet, he laid a blow to her chin with the back of his mighty hand. The warrior knelt to the ground and recovered what she had placed there for her own safety. His eyes glared. From a leather sheath at his side, he pulled a bloodied, bone-handled stone knife. He was about to strike her down when something unseen, some words from out of the invisible world, stopped him. It was Thundering Water's will, even powerful over so great a distance. The warrior laced his knife back into the sheath, shoved the amulets in the <coughs> same pouch, and then grabbed Morning Dew by the arm, jerking her from the, up from the ground. Through the maddened crowd, smoke stinging her tear-stained eyes, Morning Dew was dragged to a dugout canoe and tied there. The brave, accompanied by several of his comrades, jumped into the dugout and began to paddle out away from the scene of massive destruction, which was only now beginning to settle. Morning Dew closed her eyes, afraid of what she might, or what fate might be in the hands of these enemy men. She prayed to the Great Spirit for salvation. She lay, she lay there feeling cold, alone, sick to her stomach, unable to accept all that had just happened. There is a large village site which would one day be called the city of Detroit. The dugout stopped there for a short while to pick up supplies for the long trek north. Morning Dew heard some braves trying to trade various items for her. She heard their lewd remarks and what they had intended her to be used for. She felt relief when the warrior that had captured her refused the trade. She knew he was savage also, yet uh, so far on this voyage, which uh, she assumed would take her to, to his home, he had treated her kindly. It was early afternoon when they finally departed the huge village. On this first night they did not stop. The warriors took turns paddling through the darkness and the next day. When the sun was high in the pale blue sky, the dugout made shore. Some uh, commodities were unpacked. Morning Dew's captor, Sacred Bear, untied her hands. You must eat, sister. We have a long ways to go yet before we reach my village. 
Sister, I am not your sister. You burned one of my villages, killed my people. How, how do I know that your food will not kill me? If I was going to kill you, he replied, I would have done it when I first saw you. You were ready to, she, she um, replied, you and your bloody knife drawn. Why didn't you kill me then? He, he was thoughtful for a moment and said, something stopped me. I feel your destiny may be with my people. Your people. The people who murdered my family. How could my destiny be with your people? I prayed for my death to come, and when it, the chance comes, I will take my own life and join those that perished at your hands. He again looked thoughtful as he said, Then I will have no, I'll have to watch you closely, Morning Dew. But you must try to understand. Your people have been carrying on murderous raids against our outer villages for some time. We had to stop it. Striking a stronghold village like yours was the only way to make your chiefs think twice before assaulting our villages again. She knew what he was saying was true. Her people had attacked the villages, which they saw as a possible threat <clears throat> to their own border camps. Sacred Bear retied her hands, and once more they took to the lake to continue their voyage. With the passing of another day, Morning Dew spotted the mouth of a creek, which um, the dugout veered, veered to and made for. Despite her personal pain at the life which she had left behind her, left behind her um, she could not help but admire how beautiful this land was. She stared at the high bluff as her captors paddled past it. She could sense the ancient spirits around there. They stared at Morning Dew, making curious comments about her as her captors explained about their victorious assault on the village when they reached Sacred Bear's village. The aged bent figure of thundering water, supported by a sturdy staff, pushed through the crowd. They made way for the holy man, who was still respected by some. Others offered sneers as he approached. In these times, a war, a falling away, had occurred, and many of the children of the village felt the, that physical force was far more important than spiritual guidance. Thundering Waters looked to the captive heart and offered her a kindly smile. To his great-grandson, Sacred Bear, he said, I am old and weak. I have no one to take care of me. Give me this woman. She will serve me. Sacred Bear gave a guttural sound of disapproval. I fought for her. I have earned her. She should serve me and my family. I, Thundering Water said, have served all your families. And then he turned to the crowd. I have, have I ever asked you for anything in return? Is it so much to ask this one woman in return for all of that? He turned back to his grandson. He approached him and whispered in his ear. She is a special woman. She was spared by my prayers. You must let me have her. Sacred Bear took her tied hands and helped Morning Dew up. He untied her and then turned to his great-grandfather. You may have her. He reached into his pouch and took out her sacred amulets and placed them in her hands. These belong to you, sister, he smiled and then walked away. Thundering Waters um, turned and began to walk away also. Morning Dew followed close behind him. At the edge of the village was a small lodge. He stopped in front of it. This is your new home. My days are short, so you will not serve me long, but you will continue to serve my people. She looked at him with a puzzled expression and then asked, Why would I serve your people? I want to escape and return to those of my own family who may remain. He pulled back the, <clears throat> the skin which served as a door, and, and the two entered his home. You were spared by my prayers. Let me see the amulets which Sacred Bear gave you. She handed them to the elderly shaman. You see, we are kin to each other. I am now your family. These stones show that you are a prophetess a shaman. I am the village shaman, so there is a strong bond between us. I prayed for your coming, though I never expected a woman would be sent. I am a woman, and the Great Spirit has given me great po and powerful gifts. Oh, I am pleased with the Great Spirit's choice, Thundering Waters said. Women shamans, though few and far between, are generally of the greatest power. But do you understand now? You are spiritually my daughter. Why did you pray for me to come, she asked. Surely there is someone here that can take over for you. He hung his head sadly. There is no one. There are no longer any pure hearts here. My people are obsessed with war and helping to expand our territories. Our village used to be concerned with our own survival. The creek provided everything we needed. It still does if the people would just stop and realize that. She sighed as thundering waters headed back, <clears throat> or handed back her amulets. You are my father now, but you, your people will never accept me. Thundering Waters was determined to change the warring course of destruction that his people had moved to. He was determined to make Morning Dew a strong medicine woman amongst his people, and he, he doubted that the people would easily accept her. 
There had never been a woman shaman amongst his people. That in itself made it a difficult task, but she was also an Iroquois, and that might make the task next to impossible. When Thundering Waters had left the lodge, Morning Dew lifted some of the floor mats to reveal the earth beneath. With the aid of a nearby knife, she dug a hole, and she took a, one last look of her amulets and then buried them, replacing the mats. In her heart of hearts, she knew that despite... <clears throat> Despite his good intentions, Thundering Waters was doomed to fail in reviving the dependence on the spirits for the care of the people. The night that Thundering Waters died, he called the village chieftain to his lodge. Thundering Waters spoke to him, I am to die. I feel it deep inside. The water spirit has given me more than my days to try to find someone who would take my place. But the people don't seem to want anyone who is a healer. All they want is a warrior to lead them. The chief, the chief um, replied boldly, Our world is different now than when you became a holy man. Our enemies are great in number. The water spirit has abandoned us. Your time is past, Thundering Waters. There is no more time left for holy men. But that as it may be, he replied, Morning Dew is a powerful seer. She can help guide you when the time comes and you realize you need one like me again. I am asking you to free her. She will stay here. Before you, as a witness, I give her my lodge and all my possessions. Treat her with respect, so that you do not incur her wrath. I will respect your wishes, Morn uh, your wishes. Morning Dew will have, it, have your lodge and all that uh, is yours, but she will be freed only to a point. Morning Dew, come here, he said. She entered from outside where she had been instructed to wait. I, the chief uh, continued to her, I know Thundering Waters has told you of his gifts to you. To a degree, you are a free woman now. You may not leave the village without a warrior escort. You must pull your own weight in the village. I am told that you are a fine potter, and that that will be your occupation here. He turned to leave, and then stopped at the door, lodge of the door, and turned to face her. Tell me, woman of the Iroquois League, are you truly a seer? Can you see the future? And she replied to him, it is as you have said. Again, Soaring Hawk turned and walked from the lodge. Thundering Waters looked to his adopted daughter, and he spoke to her. All shall be well between you and Soaring Hawk. <clears throat> and then she replied, I have seen this father. In his heart, he is a fine and proud man. He would turn from war if he would not lose the respect of his people. You must get my staff, daughter, and help me to the bluff. It is almost time for me to join my fathers who went before me. She handed him his finely carved staff and helped him up the up from the pine boughs on which he had laid. Outside they walked unnoticed by most of the camp uh, as fires blazed. Thundering waters watched closely as he passed each fire. Some families were eating, others were listening to tales told by their fathers or grandfathers, and still others were recounting stories of recent battles fought and won. At the edge of the village he turned once more to look at his people, his people gone astray. He recognized the young one as sacred, <coughs> excuse me. One young boy ran up to him crying, Grandfather, Grandfather, wait, I have something for you. He recognized the young one as sacred bear's son, Thundering Waters, and he bent down on aching knee. What is it, my little friend? And the boy replied, I was digging again on the sand flats, and I found some things that I want you to take with you on your journey. The young one was a hope for future generations because he had a deep love of the, uh, for the people who had lived here for a millennia. In the young boy's lodge, one built by his own hands, were housed many ancient relics behind, um, left behind by his ancestors. Some he had found on the surface of the shifting sands and others by digging into ancient campfires. The boy handed a leather pouch to the elder. Thundering Waters opened it and gave a glad smile. Red ochre, I have not seen any of this for many years. It is good you have brought it to me on this night of nights. There is more in there, Grandfather, Thundering Waters. Um, uh, then Thundering Waters took out a small bird-like stone, a special stone that the winds had given its shape, a stone that, told, that untold years before a mother had wanted to place in the grave of her young son who had met with a freak accident but which was accidentally lost by the shaman the boy continued it's shaped like a bird and it reminds me of you as your soul is about to take flight tears formed in thundering water's eyes as he embraced the boy thank you young son come you will go with morning dew and i you will study with her and perhaps someday share her spiritual duties 
The trio walked down through the night, down the path that thundering waters had walked thousands of times. The path climbed to the high bluff, and the silvery moon bathed the ancient spot with a spectral glow. Thundering waters sat on the warm sands. Go back now and leave me in peace. When the morning comes, I will no longer be here. Don't search for me, as I will be with the water spirit who gave me my spiritual birth. Part 3. Morning Dew. Um, came a deep call from outside the lodge. She recognized Sacred Bear's voice. Morning Dew wiped the sleep from her eyes and peeled back the skin door. What is it, Sacred Bear? Some of the women are gathered down by the creek. They are going to be taken to get clay to make pots. Soaring Hawk told me to fetch you, as it is time for you to take your place among the women of this tribe and share in their burden. She closed back the door and quickly put her feet into her soft moccasins and then exited her lodge. The morning air was chilled. Even though thundering waters had been gone for several weeks now, um, she felt a deep void of loss. Other than Sacred Bear's son, small cougar, thundering waters had been her only friend. At times, she felt as though she should try to make an escape to reach the villages of her own people so far away, but she realized that she would never get very far. Such an undertaking was fruitless. Moments later, she arrived at the bank where several canoes waited. The women got in and their and then their warrior escorts. These were perilous times, and the women were not allowed on excursions away from the village by themselves. The braves paddled the dugouts upstream towards the clay outcropping that the people of old, that the people of Annetton Creek had used since pottery was first introduced here a little over a thousand years ago. The women of the village were cold towards morning dew. She was a stranger, and none of the village women seemed to want to break the ice. <clears throat> Excuse me. There was one woodland maiden that had a tender place in her heart for morning dew, as she herself had been brought from a village far away. Pink Pebbles came under other circumstances, uh, but she arrived through marriage, and her newfound village eventually accepted her. At the clay outcropping, Pink Pebbles handed morning dew a large basket and instructed, Come with me. We have to fill these baskets. They walked a short distance from the other women, and Pink Pebbles asked in a low voice, is it true that you can see into the future? Morning Dew was rather surprised that the woman was speaking to her at all, and she answered, Some things are clear to me, important events usually. I have all the powers that Thundering Water had. If you can really tell what is to come, then tell me this. When will we stop warring? When will we dwell on Dwinnet and Creek in peace again? Morning Dew picked up a lump of clay and studied the styrations in it as though they were clear visions of the future. Peace will come again, but it will be short-lived. This village will be burned and many of its people will be killed. A few will survive, and one who walks away, one who is now a child, will become a great medicine man. He will help to rebuild a village here of spiritual people, a village that will last until a very dark age comes from other shores. Pink Pebbles looked confused. Till the time when dark age, a dark age comes from other shores? I don't understand. Nor do I, was her reply, but I see huge canoes coming from the east on the great waters. They bring evil people to all the nations currently at war, and beyond that, I cannot see. One of the braves took note that the two women had not been gathering clay but talking. Get busy. We can't spend the entire day here. Soon another war party will leave, and I will be among the braves to fight this time. The morning sun gave way to noon, and the heat of the day grew stifling. Mosquitoes buzzed about savagely. Finally, the work site was done. The work at the site was done. The women loaded the heavy baskets back into the dugouts and, with haste, returned to the village. After the women ate their, their, after the women ate, their work continued. Some of the women took their clay and laid um, the large lumps out on mats and began pounding it with rocks. It was their job to pulverize the clay into a powder. And with that done, they would remove all impurities which would cause the pots to crack when they were being fired. Morning Dew and her new friend, Pink Pebbles, were in another part of the village where, with heavier rocks, they be, were crush, be busy crushing smaller rocks into even smaller particles. These crushed rocks would later be added to the clay. The crushed rock caused the clay to bond together tightly, making a stronger finished pot. Pot making was laborious work, and under swelter, the sweltering summer sun, it seemed that the task at hand would never end. Small <clears throat> cougar approached with a gourd dipper of cool water. He handed it to Morning Dew with a happy smile, and she took a drink and then offered, some, uh, offered the rest to her co-worker. You shouldn't be doing this work, he said to her. You have more important things to do. 
Morning Dew smiled at him, and so have you. Soon you will go on your fasting. Tell me, have the little spirits come to you yet? He knew she was speaking the, uh, of the Powaganic. They are my friends. I have seen them often, sister, and they have told me to observe you and to learn from you. After a while, small cougar took a di the dipper and left the women to their work. Pink Pebbles remarked, He is the one you told me of uh, back at the clay dig, isn't he? Yes, he's a fine boy. He would serve the village well if they would let him. He is considered odd among the villagers, Pink Pebbles said. Oh, here comes Soaring Hawk. We'd better get back to work. Soaring Hawk stopped by morning dew. She could not help admiring his strong, hands the strong handsome man, and the but that he was an enemy of her people did not um, leave her mind at all. But he remarked, It looks as though you have found a small friend, Morning Dew. He is a good child, though he seems interested in strange things. She replied frankly, Perhaps they would not seem so strange if you would have followed the teachings of Thundering Waters. Perhaps Thundering Waters was a wise man, he replied, but times called for us to protect ourselves with outward force rather than prayers chanted to an unseen force that seemed to abandon us long ago. To remain chief, I have to consider what the tribe wants and what the three brothers want. That is why another war party leaves today. And she looked at him proudly and said, And will they kill and plunder more innocent women and children? When will it all end? Not until you have provoked the enemy and they come to this very village and wipe it out just as my village was wiped out. He stared at her for a moment in deep thought. You have seen this in a vision, haven't you? I have seen things, but things can be changed by, by chiefs brave enough to take a stand. And if your people come and fight us here, who will you stand for, he asked. She looked at him coldly, still deep within uh, her was a warm place for Soaring Hawk in her, in her captive heart. Who would you think I would stand for? Well, your own people, he replied. But who are my people now, Thundering? Who are my people now? Thundering Waters adopted me as his daughter. You are my people, but you will not listen. Hear the words of my prophecy, great chief Soaring Eagle. Stop worrying now before it can't be reversed. He looked at her with admiration. You are a special woman, Morning Dew, but what is written is written, and our path is set. And then she said enigmatically, Then I shall become a widow, and she turned her back and returned to her work. Soaring Eagle did not understand what she had said. How can someone with no husband become, <clears throat> become a widow? Soaring Hawk was confused with, uh, within, for strong feelings were forming for this medicine woman, feelings he had never felt for anyone before. In the coming weeks, Morning Dew became more accepted by the women that she worked with. Oftentimes, they would ask her of the future events, and she would instruct them as she could. Um, she was even called upon on several occasions to use her powers to heal sick children. By mid-July, the entire unmarried population of the tribe was in an excited state. Warriors had um, returned from another rest successful campaign, and all were looking forward to the celebration known as Running the Lights. In this celebration, many of the unwed members of the community would find their husbands and wives. A few days before the celebration, Soaring Hawk stopped at the Lodge of Morning Dew. He called for her, Morning Dew, please come out. I need to speak with you. She opened the lodge and stepped out. What is it you wish? You seem to be working well with the village, um, and I thank you for that. I have brought something for you as a gift. He stood there in silence for a long time until finally she asked, Well, what is it? From a pouch at his side he took a strand of shell beads, a wampum necklace. It was long and double strands. The beads were partitioned off by lovely freshwater pearls. I have been working on this for a while now. I feel you should give I should give I feel you should have it, for it is lovely like yourself. Morning Dew had become familiar enough with the customs of her new home to know that such a gift was an unspoken commitment between a man and a woman. He extended his hand to her, and, she pre and he presented her with the beautiful necklace. Morning Dew was a little surprised by his action. She found him handsome and very desirable, yet she had dared not to think of the village chief in such a manner. Sensing her reluctance, <clears throat> he remarked, I want only... you." I want you to have this morning dew. It does not commit you at this time. It is only to show you that I admire you and your beauty, and my intent is to someday make you my wife. She took it from his hand. It is most a most beautiful necklace, the most beautiful I've ever seen. She said while she put it around her neck, Thank you, Soaring Hawk, and, I, and though I am very surprised, I will consider your proposal carefully. 
That's all I can ask. But are you really surprised? Haven't you seen me staring at you these past weeks? Haven't you noticed all the times that I've come to you <coughs> while you were working so we could talk? Um, I did notice. I did notice, and I have noticed you also. Morning Dew sat on uh, Morning Dew sat on the lofty bluff, staring out at the dark, staring out at the creek below, and admiring the beautiful forest beyond. This is where she last saw her adopted father. This she knew was a holy place. Thundering waters had often told her about the water spirit who had many times appeared to to him, and she hoped that this sweet spirit was now was there now. O oh, great one of the waters, she said, I seek your guidance. Thundering waters appointed me to be the medicine woman of this village. If I am, I should not have a husband, for I am bound to you in a special way. Yet I feel the people will never fully accept me. And Soaring Hawk is a noble man, and so handsome. He would make a fine husband. I ask you, O oh, sweet spirit, let me know what I am to do, for my vision of the future does not seem to work when it comes to my own life. She bowed her head, and there was, and there on the ground was her answer. Laying at her feet was a small bird-like stone that small cougar had given to thundering waters the night they accompanied him to this spot. It was a sign to her that she was free to marry as long as she instructed small cougar to become the medicine man when his vision fast was completed. Thank you, water spirit, she said. Thank you, thundering waters. At last I can find happiness here. It was the afternoon of the day of the celebration of running of the lights. The eligible bachelors of the tribe were off gathering bark with which to make torches. This celebration was a way to, to, of the warriors to choose the woman they wanted to, to take as their wife. It was a proposal of marriage, a celebration of courtship, and the entire village ceased to work for that day. When darkness came, the elderly and, and married entered their lodges along with the young children. This celebration was not for them. The maidens took up a spot next to the um, many paths through the village and the woods. They sat there silently, thinking amorous thoughts, wanting for some torch-bearing brave to come and lay it beside them. Even though Morning Dew was older than most of the other maidens, she sat on the grass by her lodge in hopes that Soaring Hawk would choose this night to repeat his proposal to her. She understood the custom, and she knew what to do. When all was dark, all that could be seen were a few scattered campfires casting dark shadows across the village. The maiden's excitement began to rise. In the distance they could hear the shouts of the men, many of whom would leave in the war party the next morning. Down the wooded path from the creek came the men bearing lit torches made from birch bark wrapped around sticks. The men scattered throughout the village and looked for their intended. Each time a torch was extinguished, the observers knew that the proposal had been accepted and that the intended couple were sharing a moment's pleasure in each other's arms. Morning Dew watched as slowly a torchbearer searched her out. Her heart beat faster as the torchbearer approached, um, and Soaring Hawk's familiar form came into view. He stood before her with the soft glow of the torch lighting his handsome face. Soaring Hawk knelt beside her, and she, um, as custom dictated, took the torch and extinguished it in the sand. Morning Dew arose from the ground and took his, took his hand in hers. In the darkness, lit only by the silvery moon above, their lips came gently together. Morning Dew led the chief into her lodge, and in the deep darkness they shared their love with each other. In the following weeks, Morning Dove and Soaring Hawk spent many days and nights together. She moved into his lodge with the intentions of allowing Little Cougar to have the medicine lodge after his vision quest. Uh, Morning Dew, though still distraught over the fate of her home village when she was captured, was personally happier than she had ever been before. When Soaring Hawk was out on a hunting party, she busied, her, busied herself instructing Little Cougar in the ways of the shaman. It was toward the end of summer that Little Cougar left the village to go and seek his vision, but Morning Dew had a vision of her own, a disturbing vision that she kept to herself. Late one chilled evening, Soaring Hawk and, Mountain Dew, and Morning Dew, Mountain Dew, sorry about that, folks, and Morning Dew sat next to the campfire in their lodge. His strong arm was around her as she stared into the fire. Softly he told her, I have news I must tell you, my dear wife. At the council of the chiefs, a decision was made that one last war party is to raid the enemy camps on our southern borders. It was decided that a chief would lead this raid. By the passing of the Calumet, I was chosen to lead the party. Concern played across her lovely features. I knew this from a vision, Soaring Hawk. I have kept this to myself many weeks, fearing that the village people would think I was trying to keep you from attacking my former tribes. 
But now, my love, I must tell you. Soaring Hawk looked deep into her eyes. Tell me your vision, but I can see it is not good. I told you months ago, she said, that I would become a widow before you ever declared your intentions to me. I recall how puzzled you looked, and even then I did not understand until recently why I said that. I saw your war party in a dream. I saw your proud body trampled down and bloody. Your brave spell in defeat when you were suddenly and unexpectedly ambushed. Your body was spit upon by those foes that our, my new people, so often had left in defeat. There will be no burial for you here in the land of your ancestors. And then he, he replied, Where and when will the ambush come, Morning Dew? Tears brimmed in her eyes. That was blocked from my view. All I could see, all I cared about, was you, Soaring Hawk. Find a way to stop this madness before it's too late. He shook his head. It's already too late. You know as well as I that I can't violate the wishes of the council, and that would mean my death at the hands of my own brothers. It would be better I die fighting for a cause. Surely by now my reputation as a seer is known by the council. Can't I speak to them? Let, them, let me tell them what I know. Again he shook his head. My love, what, is, what a truly inescapable situation we are in. You and I know that you are no longer Iroquois, but they would never believe you. They would think that you were protecting the people who were once your own. There is no escape for us. Let us just live in love now, and I will carry the memory of your beautiful face into battle with me, and into the next life. But I have told, not told you everything, Soaring Hawk. Winter shall be late this year, but it will be harsh. Our village will put up a large storehouse, which they will never use. The Iroquois will strike back, and... All, save for a precious few, will be destroyed. He was now even more concerned, concerned for his wife, and for the young boy who was almost like his own. The war party is to leave in seven moons. I will take you and little cougar to, the win to a winter camp where you will be safe. It is far enough away that the raiding party will not find it, and after the attack, return, and maybe then those remaining will listen to the ways of peace. It would do no, no good to warn them now. She considered for a long moment. I will go, but I must also have pink pebbles with me, and with me and you, my husband. Before your brothers find us, they will need your strong powers to help us rebuild. No, he replied. I'll see you safely there, but then I must take my place with the great warriors of the ages. The fire grew dim, and in the faint dreamy light, they fell back on the mats and deeply into each other's embrace. As soon as Little Cougar returned from his vision a sacred meeting with the water spirits, his name was made Changing Wind. He, along with Morning Dew and Pink Pebbles, were escorted to a winter lodge by Soaring Hawk. The couple, whose love was doomed from the beginning, walked down a wooded trail out of the sight of the winter lodge. He took her in his arms and kissed her tenderly. I know it has not been long, but it is time. But it, this time you have been my wife has been the happiest of my life. I cannot believe the happiness that came out of the sorrow which you brought, which brought me to your village and to your arms. She replied, but sadness, my heart feels now, is worse than ever bef any I ever felt before. Is there nothing I can say or do to make you stay? We could go to go west with, when the spring comes. And he replied, I would love, I would live my life in disgrace, and a chief cannot bear that sort of life. I must leave, but this is only for a short time as the Manitous count the seasons anyways. Our love will endure, and when you shut your eyes on this world, you will come to a lodge on the edge of a deep forest, and it is a lodge I will have readied for you. He brushed a tear from her eyes, and with the back of his strong hand, I must go now, my love. He kissed her tenderly, and then departed down the well-trodden path to meet his destiny, and it was the last that they had ever seen of each other until they met in the forest in the spirit realm of Gitche Minitu.